The SaaS MVP model has changed. Before 2018-ish, you could bootstrap a scrappy startup, call yourself CEO, and easily get away with going live with an unpolished software MVP, launch to market, and even drive impressive revenue goals. But today, the MVP model has evolved by a huge fold. Now, I'm really glad that I was just within range of this transition to capitalize on the older scrappy MVP model before the bar started to rise. That's why my startup Glorify had a lot of success when we launched in 2019. Within three months of launch, we passed 300 thousand dollars in revenue this is what it looked like at the time now can we have the same success today with a product that looks like this highly unlikely and there's so many little factors to why this is the case such as the democratization of uix design through figma's huge success followed by many of our favorite platforms having huge facelifts including facebook google youtube and spotify with the bar raised to such a high level you have a whole new set of rules to compete in today's market as a software founder Stick around to find out what those are. Just before I get into it, if you're new to this channel, I'm Omar Farouk, designer turned founder of multiple tech startups. In this channel, I share all of my learnings around building delightful products and try my best to achieve breakthrough growth. So if this stuff excites you, then go ahead and click subscribe to stay notified. If you look at the last three years, Google, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, Spotify, all these platforms have had huge major facelifts in the last three years alone. But why? Why all this effort to change something that's already functional with millions of users? Well, as technology evolves and server costs become more efficient, it becomes easier to build software products, both cloud and native, and even cross-platform. In fact, startups are launching applications that work on both desktop and mobile across all operating systems. And because of that, all giants that we know today have this underlying threat along with competing with other existing giants sharing their space. That's why larger companies are always on the hunt to acquire smaller companies that complement their existing product line. It's not only to bring new streams of revenue, but to stay competitive. Remember, many of the platforms we use every day were built in pre-smartphone era or in its infancy stages. And re-tech stacking often also comes along with a redesign. The user experience needs to be familiar on all devices. And to do this, companies need to build a super scalable design system that allows them to build prototypes and test features fast. And I mean super, super fast. fast. This leads me to my next point, democratization of UI UX design. UI UX design within the last decade has been emerging and evolving fast. And I mean super fast. UI UX design itself is an amalgamation of many things that came in the past, from the first ever digital interface to Douglas Engelbart inventing the mouse all the way to Azar Raskin inventing the infinite scroll. So to unpack this, we need to speak about interface design itself. Now, historically, interfaces were mainly designed directly by front-end developers using code. But as demands grew for the digital experience to be uplifted aesthetically, the process started to change. Designers were the first to beautify the web. It started off with legacy tools like Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. Yeah, I've been there. It's painful. Until in 2010, during the rise of the smartphone era, an innovative company decided to redesign the process. They were called Sketch. Now, they started out as a vector-based design tool and slowly pivoted to focusing on user interface design. The timing was impeccable. With all the third-party developers building apps on iOS like the world owes them money, it was more important than ever to bridge the gap between design and code. Sketch brought a new wave of design thinking. As a result, UI UX design started emerging fast and creating a breed of designers that made software intuitive, easy, and delightful to use. The difference with Sketch compared to most other design tools was the efficiency allowing you to design on an infinite canvas to have all your screens laid out in the user experience and saving reusable components as symbols. It also had very powerful features in terms of layout and structure so you can stick to your different responsive grids. However, many designers were left alienated due to Sketch being exclusively a Mac OS native app. And this caused a divide in the design community. Many gravitated towards Sketch, even if it took switching to Mac OS from Windows, while some designers continued to hack their way through using Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. In fact, the first version of glorify.com, a SaaS-based design tool that I founded, was designed by me on Photoshop in 2016. Man, we've come a long way since then. Regardless, Sketch was growing at an alarming rate with huge influencers supporting them. And as you would expect, other tools started emerging both as supporting tools and plugins for Sketch, as well as new companies competing directly with them. It was an exciting time, honestly. Come 2017, whispers of this new design tool that works on the cloud started spreading around. Now, I'd seen Figma as integrations in other tools or mentioned in an article, but by that time, I'd already switched to Mac just to use Sketch. And I would imagine many other Sketch users didn't feel the need to pay attention either. But soon, everyone had to take notice. Figma was like Sketch, but simpler, easier, and it was on the cloud. That meant it was cross-platform. You never had to rely on a Mac. Figma also kept the prototyping and handoff process built in versus using external tools. 
But more importantly, it was collaborative. And that's where the head started to turn. For the first time, there was this phenomenon of designers and stakeholders working together live on the same design file. Figma allowed you to leave feedback directly on the canvas, allowing for a much faster feedback loop. And this is where Figma started to take the stage and grow exponentially. Honestly, I never thought design would become egoless to the level it is now, and all because of Figma. In the past, the design process encouraged a solo player approach in your cave, confined to your own subjective thought processes with a completely indirect feedback loop. It's insane, especially because design exists to solve problems. It's not subjective as art is. Figma undoubtedly proved that a multiplayer live feedback loop is the future forever, where every fleeing thought gets captured, where ownership is spread beyond the one that pushes pixels, where people design together for a common goal. And this led to many other companies taking after them, bringing live collaboration into the workflow. Everyone switched to Figma, and I mean everyone. All the big sketch influencers and fanatics even moved. It was so drastic, so much so that if people even heard that you were still on sketch, you were a total loser. <laughs> now the question is, when did the MVP model flip? Well, as you see in this graph, Figma started taking off in 2016, and they started growing consistently, and not long after, Adobe launched their product, Adobe XD, around 2017. It gave people even a more reason to continue to use Figma, to be honest. In fact, fast forward to 2022, it makes sense why Adobe negotiated to acquire Figma for some what, close to $20 billion, I think. But it really got interesting from 2019 onwards when Figma accelerated their design system and prototyping features. Between 2019 and 2022, they launched Smart Animate, which allowed you to create beautiful UI interactions, followed by their component variants and interactive components. For example, now you could create different states for your button or form field right inside one component and switch between them super easily. Plus, you can even prototype those variants together so that your interactions works across all your screens at scale. These features change the game. Design systemization and prototyping became so efficient that designers that built a habit around them could build a super scalable design system so that they can mock up and polish new features super, super fast. fast. And really the best part is that it became so much easier to connect the dots with a high fidelity clickable prototype. You can now experience the product before you even code. And this had a huge impact on the developer handoff. There were less questions, less documentation, less long hour alignment calls. It was all there on the prototype. With much better clarity on the design front, better code was written without having to iterate on the code level, which we all know sucks. And this is what gave rise to the new MVP model. So you can check out these diagram source from Andre Gargle, customer onboarding expert, with a little bit of my own adjustments added to them. You can see early on, as Sketch was on the rise, more SaaS companies were built for sure. But the MVP model allowed you to stay scrappy so you could build a functional and somewhat reliable product. But during that time, at least, it wasn't as important for it to be usable and enjoyable when getting to market. In fact, it was encouraged to test the market before even perfecting your product. You've seen the culture of Airbnb and Uber adopt this mantra. And of course, that is somewhat relevant today. But as Figma's global adoption was on the rise since their public launch, the old MVP model slowly started fading away. Now UI UX tools and expertise is so accessible, so advanced and so efficient that trying to cut corners in design in the name of being a cool scrappy entrepreneur that's trying to get something out there is part of this outdated hustle culture, which is quite frankly dying or at least should be dead. Why cut corners when it's super easy to build a polished product Product from the beginning. With new tools, there are new rules. Today, the MVP requires you to focus on a few yet specialized set of competitive features to differentiate while still being functional, reliable, usable, and enjoyable. You can see how much of an impact UI UX has on both reliability, usability, and enjoyability alone. And if you have your house in order with a scalable design system, you can easily roll out features fast to transition your MVP to a fully flourishing and ever expanding product. That's it for this video. If you haven't already brought in the new MVP model into your product process, I highly advise you start right now. Feel free to reach out by dropping your questions in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, I think you may dig these recommendations, so check them out and subscribe to stay notified for more content on designing and building tech startups. Bye for now and make sure you keep building.